45 minutes I have a hair caller walking in the door, how fast can you start? And I said, what's your name? <laughs> she says, I'm Kathy, I'm the owner. I've looked over your resume, I really don't think I need to talk to you too much. Oh, and by the way, we're closed Sundays, and you'll have Mondays well, and Wednesdays off. Well, bless the Lord. Does that work out for you? I said, that's perfect. I'll start in 45 minutes. <laughs> and I said, well, can I go home and get some of my stuff? She said, no, you can use mine. She was afraid I wasn't going to come back. I said, okay, I'll use your stuff, you know. And so, it's just a total godsend. Total godsend. Now this week I said, and Pastor Cliff said this was the week from H E double hockey sticks. And how many of you know when you are on the verge of a major breakthrough, everything gets turned upside down. And so a tsunami I thought the tsunami was over. I told you guys the week before that there was a tsunami, right? And I thought it was over. Well guess what? There was another tsunami. And it was coming at us in every different direction. And at us in di directions that I was not expecting. Pastor Cliff had to go for some tests. We thought he was diagnosed with one thing, and so we take him to the doctor, and the doctor's like, no, that's not the diagnosis. So he's gotta go for another test. So right away, the women in the house, right away you go, uh-oh, security blankets getting pulled, right? Because I don't make as much money as Pastor Cliff. I'm not the breadwinner. I'm not the provider. That's his job. you know. And that's hard for me coming from where I'm coming because I was the breadwinner and always was the provider and everything was mine. He got kicked to the curb. Okay? It was out of order, but that's how I was. I had to protect myself and my kids. Okay, so that's the first tsunami. Where does he come the second time? He attacks the household, right? So he came after my kids. Second tsunami. Second wave. Second round. And then the job. The family. And the ministry. Well, you didn't get attacked in the ministry. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Because when he attacked my kid, my kid inadvertently didn't even realize that she brought it onto the ministry. Because it was a reputation. It was a character defamation on my part. So God allowed in his grace to clean all this mess up. See, once the tsunami leaves, it leaves what? Mud. Amen. Needs a bunch of mess. Amen. Damage. And damage. Yes. And had we not been in the gospel of Jesus Christ, had we not heard messages about the palm tree, and how the palm tree, when it, when the waves and everything come, it bends to the right, to the left, it bends. But when, when it's done bending, it never breaks. But when it's done, it shoots right back up like it's looking towards God. And I had to bend to the right, to the left. Yes, I had to scream. Yes, I had to do all those things, but I had to rely on grace. Because even when the tsunami came, I had anger. And I know the scripture, be angry and sin not. But I did. I did. And I had to go to God and ask for repent for forgiveness and repentance. I had to tell my daughter that I was sorry. She said, but mom, it's okay, I understood. Don't make it right. 
Be angry and sin not. Pastor did not backslide for all you people that are going there in your mind. But again, I sowed words. And those words produce life or death. And see, if I would not have apologized and I would not have put some grace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I would not have put some grace on the on the subject. Those words that I said, even though they were right, they were sown in anger, they would have produced a fruit. So I had to kill that harvest. Do you understand? You had to you have to kill you have to kill the harvest that comes out your mouth. Unless it's the truth. If you are not producing life to, into somebody, then you are producing death into somebody. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, it's one or two things. My leg is killing me. My leg is killing me. My leg is killing me. Eventually, that leg is going to kill you. That's right. Why? You spoke death to your leg. Versus, I have a symptom in my leg, and my leg is bothering me. We have what we say. God did what? He spoke. So who is living on the inside of you? So the creator of the universe that spoke the universe into existence is where? So if you speak and you don't speak his language, whose language are you speaking? Yours or the devil's? Right? You're either speaking what you learned, learned behavior. My father had an explosive, reactive Italian temper. That's what I learned. Don't make it right. So you either speak that or you crucify that and speak the word. Put grace on it. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is there in case you sin. Doesn't mean that you have to sin. Doesn't mean that you have to choose to sin. Do you know that you can go through your life and purposely, as Pastor Cook said, choose not to sin? But we all sin, right? We all fall short, right? A rubber band is just a rubber band, right? Rubber band, if we had a bag of rubber bands, they would be rubber bands, right? Picture the rubber band. It doesn't have a function when it's in the bag, does it? It has no use. It's, just a, it's still a rubber band. But there's a rubber band holding her hair up. Grace only works when you take it out and use it. Other than that, it's still grace, but it, it doesn't function. It only functions when the need arises. Meaning, you fall into grace. Where sin is, grace what? Abounds. First Thessalonians 5, chapter 1, 5, verse 28. Verse 1 and 5 and then 28. Paul was always talking about grace. Actually, it's 1, 1, and then 5, and 28. It talks about grace to you and peace from our God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks. Giving thanks. That's another word for grace. Now go to 5, 28. He ends this, this, this chapter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What does the word grace mean? What does that word mean? Why is it important to keep grace? Why do we say grace? 
What is grace? It's an expression. It means to take joy, to take pleasure, to take delight. Remember I told you salvation is free. It don't cost us anything. There's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. We have to accept salvation. Go to Luke 4. God bless you. 4 and 22. When you're there, say amen. amen. Everybody there? This is Jesus standing in the temple. He had just read the scriptures. And he said, and So they all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And then they said, is this Joseph's son? Grace is a characteristic and attribute of God. It is God's loving kindness and favor towards a wretched individual's his creation. We don't have to do anything to earn grace. Ephesians Four and twenty-nine. Four and twenty-nine. Read there. Say amen. amen. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart, impart. Underline in part grace to the hearers. What does that mean? Build you up. In part. That means that if you go to another Christian, you're struggling. You're having a 911 crisis. You can't find your Bible. You can't even conjure up a prayer within yourself. You are squashed so low that you don't even know if you're saved at the present moment. And you pick up the phone and you call another Christian. And that Christian starts jumping and saying, "What? A, well, you, you know, and gets in the toilet with you and starts flushing you. Hang up that phone and get a different word. All right. Say that. Because if they are not imparting grace to you, if they are not building you up, if they are not edifying you, and saying, hey, snap out of it. God says this. This is what God is saying. Now, even if they're rebuking you in the phone call, you still should feel love. And you still should feel grace. All right. But you should, not, you should not feel defeated. You should not feel robbed of your joy, of your peace. Thank you, Jesus. Because if you feel that when you're talking to somebody else, you are talking to the wrong person. They are not the one that can build you up. They are being what? Used of the enemy to squash right, you even all further. Right, all right, expose them, Pastor. Amen. Say that. Hallelujah. You are not on the throne. You're not God. You can't judge their circumstance, their situation. I don't care what it looks like. You can only judge people's fruit. That's all we're allowed to judge. Does this look like Christ, act like Christ, talk like Christ? If it don't, goodbye. Because there are people that are there to do what? Two kinds of people in this world. The what? The givers and the takers. And how is it that the givers always get hooked up with the takers? And they get drained dry. And then the takers move on to the next. And they keep taking. Like zombies. They're spiritual leeches. They just want to latch onto you and suck all your anointing out. Suck everything that you've got. 
They don't want to go to the oil and go and get their lamps filled on their own. The same grace I have is the same grace you have. Here's the difference. I chose to grow in grace. All right. Thank you, I chose to become a disciple, not just a follower. Following Jesus is cool. It was the thing to do, right? Mm -mm. Those that followed Jesus, when it came to the hard sayings and the hard things, do you wish to go too? That's what he said. He didn't mince words. They said, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Where are we going to go? But there was, they all said they would follow him to the end. Only one stayed at the cross. Only one stayed at the cross. Now they all came back. They all did what they were told to do. They went to the upper room. They all waited for the promise. They believed his words of grace enough. Enough to do what he said. But in the hard stuff, your first reaction is to depart. <clears throat> Why does he tell us to stand? Because it's not our character to stand in the face of adversity. It's not our character. We want to run. Yes, yes. We want to rebel. We want to hightail it out of there. Get the heck out of Dodge. Whatever you got to say, you want to go. You want to shut down. You can't stay in a fight very long, can you? Somebody's going to get hurt. Ephesians 4, 29 says what? We already read that one. Go to Colossians. Four and six. Laying a foundation. Grace means charity in Greek. Four and six. Again, we're talking about what? Speaking. Let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Put your hand on your heart. Say, this word is for me. I will receive it. Because we got, we got struggling Christians, y'all. How many of us are struggling? Real deal. Struggling. And the reason that we're struggling is because we're not ruttering our tongue. We're not bridling our tongue. Guilty. Anybody else here guilty? Guilty. And after you come to yourself, the Bible says when you have come to yourself, meaning you got yourself in your right mind, then God talks to you. He's not going to talk to you when you're having a temper tantrum. He'll let you have your temper tantrum. He'll let you have all your antics and all your things and let you just have your temper tantrum and he will clean up your mess when you are all done. Why? Romans 8.28 says so. All things work together for the good. To those that are called according to his purpose. Did y'all catch that? That's not the scripture. I missed part of it on purpose. What's that scripture say? Get it. Romans 8.28. The reason I missed part of it on purpose is because you have to know the word for yourself. It has to be hidden in your heart for yourself. Eight twenty-eight says, And we know that all things work together 
for the good to those who what? Love God. Love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you see how the devil can miss part? Give you half truth? That sounded right. That sounds like, yeah, that sounds like the scripture. But it's missing parts. That's what he does. He takes the scripture and he twists it. It makes it sound like God. But if you don't have enough of the word buried in you, sound like can get you tripped up. You have to know the real deal. You have to get to the real deal. What is the real deal? The real deal is having gratitude towards one another, being gracious towards one another, loving kindness towards one another. If you do not love yourself, how can you love others? If you don't speak to yourself with words of edification, if you don't tell yourself that you are the apple of God's eye and that every hair on your head is numbered, if you're too busy telling yourself that you are stupid, why did I do that stupid thing? There I go again. I did it again. And you're too busy playing your own tape recorder with your own voice bashing you. If you cannot even sow grace to yourself, how can you sow it to somebody else? How can you impart it to somebody else? It has to be in you. Why does God always deal with us? Because you are the only one that's going to heaven by yourself, right? You're standing before God by yourself. You're not taking anybody with you. When you face that, you are facing Him. You can't blame anybody else. There's no minimization. There's no justification. There's no nothing. You're standing before God. It doesn't matter what was done to you. It doesn't matter what hurt you, who hurt you, what happened. Yada, yada, yada. Nothing matters. Because God's going to say, I gave you words of grace. I gave you words of edification. Pastor, when did you give me? You know, God, when did, I, when did I give you? When did I give you? He's going to say, I gave you my son. I gave you the living word. And better yet, I had men write it down. 66 different books all throughout time. Yes. You had a Bible, didn't you? Well, yes, God, I had a Bible. But I didn't know how to read. It doesn't matter. Because just because you don't know how to read, you know how to ask somebody to read it to you. Nowadays with technology, you can go on the computer and get a free Bible, press the little speaker, and it reads to you. It reads right to you. Oh, but I don't have a computer. Okay. Nine times out of ten with technology, you can go on TV, and they're reading it to you on the TV. You have not because you ask not. And so there's no excuse under the sun in today's age. Yes. See, they didn't have the Bible. It was still being written back then. Amen. So guess what? They verbally had to pass it down. <coughs> verbally. And the scribes had to write it. But they verbally had to say it. Can you imagine sitting there listening to all that genealogy in numbers? But that's how they gave the word. <coughs> Words of grace. When we accept God's grace, we are in a state of grace. Romans 5, 1 through 2. We're going from speaking grace now to being in a state of grace. That means walking in grace. Because our, our Bible was translated in Greek, one word can mean five different things. 
okay? So when, when God is saying, study yourselves to show yourselves approved, he, what he's really saying to you is dig out the scripture. Take the word that you're studying, if it's love, if it's grace, if it's anger, learn it in the Greek, learn it in the Hebrew, get commentaries, ask other people, but dig it out. Dig it out. Five, one through two. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, so now we move from talking to grace to being in grace, to standing in grace. This is our spiritual state. This is how we are to act one towards another, but this is also how we act with God. We have a position with God Meaning that we can go boldly to his throne because of what? Grace and mercy. 1 Peter 5 and 12. Here Peter again, they're closing their, their letter. He says, Belsavanius, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Grace is unmerited favor. It is our expression of love one towards another. In God's grace extended to us. Salvation is first and foremost. That's your first step. That's the first thing that you do. When you accept salvation, grace automatically comes. God doesn't owe us anything. But as sinners forgiven, we owe Him. We're indebted to Him. And so this is what Paul's and Peter is talking about is talking about growing in grace, growing in the faith, growing. Because we deserve what? We deserve hell, right? We were sinners. Is there a good person that's going to heaven? Can you just get there on your goodness? I don't, how, I don't care how good you are. Can you get there? No. Can you get there if you believe in Buddha? No. Can you get there if you believe in Muhammad? No. The Bible says there's only one way to get there. One way. And you have to go through the what gate? Narrow gate. Narrow is the way. Ephesians 2, 5 through 8. Even when we were dead to trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together where? In heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ for by grace you have been saved through faith not of yourselves it is the gift of God grace is a gift if I was to give you a gift I'm giving you this gift it's all packaged up. It's all nice. And you take the gift and you take it home and you put it on your shelf. Is it still a gift? It's still a gift, right? It's still a gift. 
But would, when I ask you about the gift, you say, I didn't open it. It's sitting on the shelf. How am I going to feel about you not opening your gift that I gave you? Not appreciated. I'm going to feel what? Not appreciated. Not appreciated. God gave us a gift. And every now and then he wants to hear us say what? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But if you take grace and you set it on the shelf, you don't use it. You don't grow in it. You don't speak it. You don't stand in the state of grace. How effective is grace for you? It's not effective, is it? Romans 3, 23. I'm laying a foundation which we're going to build upon. I quoted the scripture already. It says, For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption work of Jesus Christ. There's no order to grace. First, you believe in your heart. You repent. Means you turn from your ways. You confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You get baptized. That's salvation. We are all unworthy servants. But here's what God's grace does after salvation. And this is where we struggle. This is where some of us are going to be eating off that tree in heaven. Because God's grace requires holiness. And it requires right living. Ouch. How many of us have heard the term, you don't want to keep doing that because God's grace will run out. God's grace is running out. And when God's grace runs out, guess what you get? You get mercy. You get mercy. And mercy is only for one thing. Mercy only is for one thing when judgment is happening. That's when you want mercy. But I would rather have grace before judgment. I would rather have grace before judgment. Because remember, we were all judged already because we were what? Sinners? Right? So our judgment was what? Yeah. Death. Yes. All have sinned and we are worthy of death. Yes. But because of Jesus Christ and him crucified and the grace as I hear it, grace and mercy kissed at the cross so that abstained the judgment. The judgment is on hold for all those that come into the revelatory knowledge of Christ. Getting saved is not enough. What do you mean, Pastor? Getting saved only releases you from the judgment. But now you're required because of your salvation, you've been saved. You're in the lifeboat. You're not on the Titanic. You're not in flames going down in the fiery inferno. 
How dare you take your salvation and not give it freely to somebody else? How dare you abandon ship and let everybody else perish going down with the ship? How dare you not speak the same grace that God offered you to somebody else? When the situation came up, that it came up, and I had to talk to my daughter's friends and I had to clean up I had to clean up some stuff I had to speak grace into the situation first I had to apologize that for some reason my daughter failed them instead of leading them to the light she wasn't she was just hanging out and being a kid and these two friends, unfortunately, are very troubled individuals. And I had warned my daughter already, lead them to Jesus. They're hurting. They're broken. Lead them to Christ. Lead them. And so because I felt the ball got dropped with the situation that arose, I brought him here sat him down and I said now you're going to meet Jesus Christ now you're going to understand grace and mercy because see just as you are I once was everything that you are going through I am on the other side and I'm sorry that the ball got dropped but see, blood is no longer on our hands because you now know Jesus. I introduced you to him. And what you do with him now, it's on you. It's on you. But grace had to be imparted into that situation. Into those individuals. See, who is grace? You are grace if you have Jesus living on the inside of you. You are grace. Yes, yes, yes. My name means graceful. I'm far from graceful. Never been graceful. I have no clue how to be graceful. When I hear graceful, I think of some elegant ballerina dancer floating through the air. But you know what? That's not graceful. That's my mental image. But you know what graceful is? It's a state of being. It's a speaking. So I am graceful. See, you have to understand. Words have power. They have meaning. They produce life. Or death. Yes. Paul continually admonishes us over and over again, if you read any of Paul's writings, to put away fleshly desires, to put away ungodliness, to put away those things, cut them away, do away with them. He even tells us it's better to go into heaven with one eye That's if your said. eye causes you to sin. Yes. Pluck it out. Go to heaven with only one arm. Because if that arm is causing you to sin, cut it off. That's pretty vivid. He's giving you a pretty vivid visual picture, right? Amen. He's trying to tell you the severity of staying on the fence and being lukewarm. God gives you even one better. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you up. Who likes to throw up in here? I don't. And I don't really want to be on the fence and have God throw me up. But God said, you either got to choose me all the way, hot, fervent. Can't be both. Pastor, it's Friday night, and it, you know, it's bar night, and... and 
you know, I'll, I'll clean up by Sunday, but I gotta go get my drink on, and I gotta go do my partying, and I gotta go do 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 da. Go. Oh, you have free will. And nothing wrong with drinking. You get drunk, you got a problem. Because the Bible says you can drink a little. But we don't ever do a little, do we? We as human beings never do a little, do we? No. <laughs> One glass of wine turns into a bottle. One bottle then gets upgraded to the fifth. The fifth then turns into whatever else you want to do. Sin goes downward. It's a progression. You don't just do one little sin. Usually if you're angry, anger leads all the way to murder because you've killed that person in your mind. Sin doesn't always just start out with one little oops. It always spirals down. Further and further. But we have what? Grace. Because if there's sin abounding in your life, the grace of God is there to cover you. But remember I said we didn't have to choose? We could choose to live soberly. We could choose to live righteously. We could choose to live godly. We could choose to talk right, act right, be right. It's a choice. Amen. It's a choice. Just like we choose to believe that we're going to see Jesus come back in the clouds, right? We never saw Jesus. But we have that hope. Why? Because we believe the words that are written in the book. So he said it, so we believe it. Amen. Right? Amen. But those hard sayings, we do what with? That don't apply to me, Pastor. That's right. That's too hard. Jesus didn't really mean that, did he? That's what we say. He's a loving God. God wouldn't really throw me in hell. I'm a good person. Amen. God loves you all the way to hell. It's your choice whether you want to go in the gate. Titus 2. I'm going to finish in just a few minutes. Give me five more minutes. And if you're a Baptist, this is my first close, and I might have two more. That was a joke. When you have it, say amen. 2, 11 through 13, somebody read. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have... For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have begotten to all men, teaching us that dying ungodly and worldly lusts should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can choose to live right. He was always my, my fear when I was really, really young. Because they always talked about the rapture happening right away, right away. Am I, now I was a child, very young in the Lord, but my fear was always, man, if I do that, if I sin, what if the rapture happens and I miss it? Okay, I didn't have a knowledge that he was able to keep me. He was able to protect me. I didn't have a knowledge of grace. I was young, right? And so that fear even though it was a, a terror, because I was afraid of missing the rapture, but that fear drove me further and deeper into God, further and deeper into the knowledge of God. And the more you dive further and deeper into the knowledge of God, guess what you are going to find? You're going to find God. 
And you're going to find his characters, his attributes, his characteristics, his manners. And then that fear subsides. And you come into wisdom. And you grow in grace. And they that win souls are wise. And so then you become a soul winner. And that was my goal. God, let me help. You helped me. You rescued me from my own prison. Please, God, let me help somebody else. Please. I was begging God. He didn't need me to beg. He just needed a willing vessel to go out there and do. But when you don't have a knowledge of grace, you always consider yourself unworthy of even Jesus. And you think you have to wait for some formula to go out there and do what he told you to do. There's no formula. He said, go, go. He said, do it, do it. You don't need... To be ordained, to, wit to witness, you are a witness. All right. You just need to live right, act right, talk right, put on Christ, fake it till you make it. If you don't know where the scripture is, take him to somebody that does. You know, I, I, I don't know, I just know it works. I used to say that all the time. I don't know. I just know it worked. It worked for me. And they say they would try to get deep in their theology. I don't know about all that stuff. I'm not a Bible scholar, but I can take you to one who is. If you want to know all that stuff, I can take you. You come to church with me. I'll take you. I'll introduce you to the past. They're Bible college students. Da, da, da. They'll take. I don't know. I just know that this works. And they'd say, "You're 100% different." I'm telling you, it works. And that's how I won souls. That's all the knowledge I had. It works. God saved me. I was wretched. Now I'm free. I was bound. You don't need a whole lot of words. You just need grace. Just give them grace. Which is give them Jesus. Be zealous in whatever you do. What does When you think of a zealot, what do you think of? You think of someone that's really hot, passionate about what they're doing and the cause that they're fighting for, right? If you think of the Crusaders, they were passionate. Unfortunately, they were misguided, but they were passionate about killing everybody. They named it in the cause of Christ. They were passionate. Hitler, passionate. That's right. That's right. Misguided. Amen. Passionate. God wants you to be hot and passionate for him and for his things. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Who's got it? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own self, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do. That's his salvation. Pastor, salvation's free. It didn't cost us anything. But didn't she just say, work it out? That's the word. Work it out with what? Fear. With fear and trembling. Now, I don't think that that means that that terror fear, right? No. No. That means that fear and that reverence of God. Tremble at his presence. The awesomeness and the magnitude of him. Give him respect. Right? 
Because he works in us. He's, he's working in us to do what? His will. His good pleasure. He doesn't want to see you broke, busted, and disgusted. <laughs> what parent? Whose parents in here? Amen. What parent wants to see their kid living on the streets? No way. On drugs? God forbid. Being a whoremonger? Jesus, help us, Lord. But we know that kids will make their own choices, right? Yes, and do. unfortunately, they might choose to go that way. Does that mean that we don't love them? No. Does that not mean when, when they come to us that we're not going to give them grace, maybe feed them? Sometimes love must be tough, and you have to send them back out so that they learn their, the error of their ways. Don't think that God will not let you have enough of yourself to show you the error of your ways. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things Hallelujah. through Christ who yes. strengthens me. Yes, Lord. Have your way to help yourself. When I was smoking, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with smoking. It's an addictive personality, and, and, and you can get deliverance, so please don't feel condemned. But I did not want to smoke. I'm the type of person I want to get to the why I do what I do. And smoking is a reaction for an inner pain that's going on. So when I smoked, I would say, God, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I want to give this up. I would still smoke. But I would quote scripture and each day I continued to resist. The urges left. Why? Because I was depositing truth. I didn't have truth in me. What did I have? I was the, a child of the father of lies. So I had lies in me. I was a sinner. I knew how to sin. So when you come to Christ, you have to learn how to be a Christian. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have to get the revelation knowledge of God in you. The truth is not going to come by osmosis. That's right. You can't drink truth. It, it's, you can't inject it. It's not some magic pill you can swallow and boom, you know truth. You have to read truth. Breathe truth. You have to be around truth. So that means you have to surround yourself with godly counsel. If you are a baby Christian, you need to surround yourself with those that have been in the body for a long time. You're supposed to submit yourself so that you become a Christ disciple, not just follower, disciple, which means you discipline yourself. You cut things away. You go through spiritual boot camp. When you were a child, you did as a child. You thought as a child. But now, you're a little older in Christ. And those childish things, you have to put them away. How do you look saying, well, I've been in church 35 years. And they look at you like you're saved? The world will tell on you. They know Jesus sometimes better than you. And they will tell on you. They'll say, that's not how a Christian talks. That's not how a Christian acts. And they will check you. Don't take it wrong. Don't get offended. Inspect your own fruit. They're telling you they, that you're producing bad fruit. They don't want to eat from your tree. So you have to inspect yourself. When I was in the bar, this one person 
They used to run him out of the bar because the minute that he would get drunk, I didn't know what prophecy was. But the minute that he would get drunk, see, gifts and calls are with the what? Out repentance, right? The minute he would get drunk, he would start spilling the Bible. And he would run everybody out the bar because he would preach drunk. Prophesy. And we would be like, man, you're killing our, our drinking. You're killing our fun. Why? Because he was speaking truth. He was speaking the truth. That's how I know gifts and calls come without repentance. God can use anybody. And see, he would do that. Finally, they had to put him off the bar. They told him to go to church. Go where you belong. They told him, you don't belong here. You need to go to church. That's a good one. That'll preach, Pastor. Go where you belong. I was having a conversation with a lady to, the other day, and she was we were talking, and she's, she's Catholic, and she's having some problems with what's going on in the Catholic church. And me being Catholic at one time, I told her my story. I said, well, I said, I can't talk too much about that. I can only tell you what happened to me. I said, and it came when I was supposed to get confirmed because they have these rituals. He wanted me to bow down and kiss his ring. And I had an issue with that. And so I asked him why, because I wanted to know why. And so I asked him, and he really couldn't give me a definite answer. And I said, well, I can't do that. And so he told my mother, this one does not belong here. You need to take her and find her a church where she belongs. She don't belong with us. So that kind of set my mother into a reaction. Everybody's Catholic in our family. We were born Catholic, raised Catholic. Everybody's Catholic. She's Italian. Where am I going to take her? And so he didn't know what he was doing. Okay? What he was really doing was being led by God. Because it sent me on a journey to find God. The way that I read and interpreted in my scriptures. So see, he meant it for evil. Okay? He meant it for eval. He meant it to hurt me. Say that. Another another rejection from a man who's the archbishop. <sighs> meant it to squash and meant it for evil. But God worked it out and sent me. See, because what, what he didn't realize, he didn't know, is from the time I was 13, I didn't get confirmed until I was 18, but from 13 to 18, five years, no, that's wrong, eight years, so it must have been when I was 11, I had the same dream every single night, every single night had the same dream, I would go to church in my dream. Flip side, I was still being a hellion and raising hell. But at night, I was going to church in my dreams. And I would go and I would tell the priest, these people dance, they sing, they do this, they raise their hands. What is all this, raising hands? We didn't do that. Why are they having so much fun in church? And I would ask him these questions and he would be like, I have no clue what you're talking about. But see, God had already been preparing me and dealing with me. Even though I was raising all this hell, remember we're a trichotomy being. There's three parts to us. And so I couldn't stand this part of me. I could not stand the hell that I was creating. And when you cannot stand the hell that you create, what happens? You abuse yourself. You hurt yourself. So I, I cried out. I had enough knowledge of God to cry out, to beg for redemption from this. God's grace forgives us of our sins. All of them. 
even the ones we commit after we're saved. Can you commit sins after you're saved? Yeah. You can. But the more that you reject and resist the devil, the more that he flees. But you have to do what? You have to submit yourself to God. Everybody forgets the first part of that scripture. The first part of that scripture is submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. We always quote the second one because it sounds the easiest, but submission to God is obedience to God, and that means 100% doing the whole book. Hallelujah. The whole book, not yes. just the parts you like. Yes, Lord. Lord. And that takes time. That takes heeding God's word. That takes, I don't understand why pastor's asking me to vacuum the church. All right. Maybe pastor just wants to see if you're going to be obedient to vacuum the church. I don't understand why I have to do this. Do you know, for 17 years, I gave my pastor a cup of water. For 17 years, I carried her briefcase. For 17 years, I was comfortable doing just that. I didn't complain. I didn't ask why. Why couldn't you get nobody else to carry your briefcase? Why couldn't you get nobody else to give them water? Didn't ask. For 17 years, that was the position they gave me, and I did it. I was willing, and I was obedient. And I believe that scripture, you give a prophet a cup of water, you shall get a prophet's reward. So I knew eventually my reward was coming. Like Pastor Cliff said, I just needed transportation. I didn't put hubcaps on it. I needed a reward. I didn't tell God what reward I wanted. You are the reward. This is how he rewarded me for being willing and obedient and not complaining about carrying the cup and the briefcase. Sometimes you don't understand why you have to do. And I watched people elevated to positions that had just come in the church. It hadn't been there but two minutes. And they got elevated, promoted. Prophet so-and-so, apostle so-and-so. I'd be like, God, when, when? When is it my turn? And then right away I'd say, stop. Don't ask those questions. Just serve. Just serve. Because see, we don't understand elevation. Elevation comes from God, and it's in His timing. And sometimes we think we're going to get elevated in the place of where we're serving. A lot of times you get elevated when he takes you out of the place that you have been for a very long time. Don't you see? And he takes you and he moves you. Yes, Lord. And there you have to serve again. Amen. But he takes that knowledge that you gained by willing, willing and obedient and he plugs you in someplace else where you're needed. It's his body. He's grafting you in. You don't get to tell him where you are on his tree. You don't get to tell him where you are in his body. He is the one that tells you where you fit. He is the one that puts you where he wants you. All he asks you is to be a willing and obedient. Submit yourself to God. You cannot habitually practice sin and submit to God. God can't have it. He's a just and holy God, and he cannot stand sin. He can't. And when you habitually, habitually practice sin, you crucify Jesus afresh. I didn't say it. The word did.
Children are only children to what age? Thirteen? Thirteen. That's actually the age of accountability. Thirteen. Then they become what? Teenagers. They're no longer children. They're teenagers. I'm pleading with you to grow up. The times and the signs of the times are coming. And you have to grow up. You have to grow up in your grace. You have to work your, your salvation out with fear and trembling. You have to get to that point where you put away childish things. You can't willingly go about your life sinning. Mm -hmm.